let's uh, think about this in the context of a particular oral mm -hmm. history. So uh, let's go to the history, uh, the oral history that Lucy Kalkin did. Um, uh, we had letters mm -hmm. from her, mm -hmm. and then about 10 years after her wartime experience, uh, she was interviewed, uh, she and several other people, but she specifically. So was there anything that we learned about Lucy Culkin's uh, experience from her oral interview that we didn't already know and understand from the letters that she had provided. So I think part of the value of oral history is that it is an oral document and I say oral A-U-R-A-L. It is is something that you listen to. So we have transcripts which are you know important that you read the transcript but oral histories are meant to be heard and in listening to the interviews, the kinds of things that you hear in terms of tone, inflection, accent, pauses, silences, um, they help us understand and help tell us the story in a way like flat text doesn't, right? So that's one thing that I think it brings a kind of richness, richness and emotion um, to help us understand the the past. The other thing though I think and you know the the oral history from Lucille Culkin is really uh, a great uh, oral history to use because we have the archival documents so uh, again even as I said memory may be failing but then you have the archival documents to kind of speak to or speak with the oral history in really important ways um, and so I think that that is a really great oral history to use. Um, one of the things, or a few things that come out, I think, in terms of the oral history is that it helps us fill out the uh, blanks in the papers. So, you know, I think people, when they record, when they write letters or when they take notes, that is a very purposeful um, kind of recording, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know that when Lucille wrote her letters, she thought, you know, 50 years from now, somebody's going to read these who I didn't intend for them to read. Um, but she wrote those letters understanding that they would be read, you know. So there is a kind of public performance to the writing of those letters, or she took those notes, um, you know, and they were extractions of the experience that she was experiencing or, or responding to. The oral history helps us understand her kind of interior sense or approach to these letters, to these documents. So we, we hear in oral history um, talking about her courtship with her husband, right? Now she doesn't go into details about all of the letters, but we have the letters for that. But she does tell us about their relationship and how she met them and 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 I think the kind of um, you know courtship that they had and so that's just an example of something right. that the oral histories bring I think um, another really important or an important um, insight that the oral history of Lucille Culkin provides um, are her kind of views looking back on those experiences um, in particular, her opinions about the disparities that she experienced. Um, I don't know that she may have took time or to record like, oh, the, I'm not getting paid as much, or I, you know, all the women are being categorized as you know mechanics learners and getting 58 cents uh, an hour. Um, but it isn't until we fought to get reclassified that we got parity, at least with, with the third class of, of men. So. This is not something that she would have necessarily known at the time that she was creating what is an archival document. It is something that comes with hindsight, where you, you have distance and you can put your historical experience in a, in a broader context. And that helps us you know, make sense of these archival pieces. One of the things that struck me when I was reading the transcript was her description of her mother's response when she, Lucy, decides yes. to leave <coughs> her very respectable job as a social worker and go to work in a factory or in the 
Brooklyn Navy Yard. Yes. yes. And there's a, there are two sides to that, where yes. she, on the one hand, says, well, I really wanted to do this for patriotic reasons, but my mother didn't want me to do it. And as she looks back on it, she thinks about the question of what was then thought of as respectable. Right. That's really that passage where she talks about her decision to um, work to, to make this career change or this, this job change is really interesting um, for many reasons. One is the response of her mother and, and I think we kind of, her mother becomes a kind of stand-in for a traditional view, which she says yes. her mother had a traditional view. But, but it's really interesting because she goes on to talk about her father and she was like, he didn't really say much. And then she says, but he wasn't the dominant voice in the household. The household. So yes. it, it, it really throws us for a loop. Here yeah. we are thinking that her mother's is like just traditional, but we understand that her household was, was different, right? right. Um, and even looking at Lucille's background of having gone to Erasmus High School and then having gone to Hunter College, and you know, her, it, it, it does make her somewhat exceptional in making this decision. And, and then her reflections after looking back. Um, well, it's the reflection about yeah. wearing trousers, yes, that, yes, which yes, is a kind yes. of mark of yes, a movement yes, into yes. the. Factory. Yes, and I mean, so the. Um, she talks about, in some of, when she talks about some of the experiences, some of the, the kind of changes or um, differences she encountered, you know, she talks about having to wear pants. And then there's this whole discussion about, well, did you change into the pants when you got there? Or did you, and she was like, you know, I never wore pants. Like, you just never wore pants. She was like, you may have worn shorts in the summertime, but you just never wore pants. And then she's like, but we had to wear, I had to wear the pants when I left work because I had to wear un thermal underwear, right. like long jobs, right. right? So, right. so I, I mean, I think, you know, that kind of, uh, that moment really gives us a sense of, how significant this was. Yes. Right? Um, and she helps, us, she helps us understand um, how significant it was. Now, what's, what's interesting to me is when she's in the panel discussion, and the panel discussion, I think, happens like a week after the oral history interview. And so it's always important to think about when these things are happening. Mm. Um, her conversations, her comments in the panel are much more kind of like, oh yeah, that happened. You know, they're a, they're a lot less filled with the surprise. Yes. Right? And part of that is because this is this conversation is happening in 1989 and, you know, women wearing pants is not a big deal or women working in the workplace is not a big deal. And so I think collectively the women in that conversation are like, oh yeah, it's, you know, um, you don't get the same sense in that conversation of the big deal this was, as you do in the first interview with Lucille, yes, yeah. right? And that's, that's, so one of the things about, we have to think about oral history is, you know, people, you, you ideally want to interview people who've never been interviewed before. Because what happens is people get kind of practiced at storytelling. Right, exactly. And then the story becomes very kind of formulaic and, packaged and you kind of see that difference in tone and in approach um, but in the first interview there's this clear like and wearing pants and and that represented a kind of freedom um, and that's conveyed uh, another kind of uh, freedom that is conveyed is the loosening of language I, the loosening of tongue right the right. The, the ways that women began um, marking their acceptance from their male co-workers was that these male co-workers felt comfortable using language that they had previously would only use around men.